Good evening, everyone. My name is Andy Lyon. I'm a public information officer with the Alaska Incident Management Team. And thank you for coming out to our community gathering here in Willow Creek. Um, if you cannot hear me or other speakers, please let us know. We'll do what we can. We may get interrupted by highway noise and helicopter noise, but we're doing our best to uh, make sure that everybody can hear. As you can see, we are also recording this for playback later on YouTube, so your friends and neighbors who are unable to make it tonight can, uh, can watch that. And uh, we have information officers in the crowd. They have uh, little cards with a piece of paper with links to uh, where you can find the link to YouTube and where you can get additional information. So if you didn't get one of those yet and you'd like one, Please get one of those, and you can uh, tell your friends where to find this recording. We're going to give you a fire up, uh, operational update and talk a little bit about what is going on here in the forest. Uh, we're going to hear first from Tara Jones, our agency administrator for the Shasta Trinity National Forest, then from uh, some of our operational folks, uh, Brandon Peterson, who's our branch director. That's the of the lead firefighter for your part of the fire here and he'll give you a, an update about what's happening out there on the ground then another one of our operations section chiefs brad washaw washaw sorry brad is uh, going to talk about the weather and fire behavior because that's critical for us this weekend uh, then our air resource advisor josh hall will talk a little bit about the smoke outlook luckily uh, you're on the west side and you've been getting cleaner air than the folks over in redding and Weaverville, and then Mark DePero, who is the Six Rivers National Forest uh, representative here with us, will speak. And then finally, we'll hear from our uh, incident commander, one of our incident commanders, Chuck Russell. We're going to have time for your questions. We'd ask you to come over here and use this microphone so we can capture that question. If, if you don't want to do that, that doesn't make you feel comfortable. Obviously, there are plenty of representatives of the fire here, so you can wait and we'll hang out and you can ask your question in person after we conclude our taping. Any questions before we get started? All right, thanks again for being here. And we're gonna start with Tara Jones from the Shasta Trinity. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanna start off by uh, well, I want to apologize that this is the first time I've made it over here in person since the fire started. There was a whole road closure thing I was having a hard time with for a while there. But um, I want to just uh, thank you all for all of the wonderful support that you've had for our firefighters out there um, and let you know that, uh, you know that your support really does mean a lot to them. Um, they, they read those things on, on Facebook. They see the signs that you put up. They appreciate the, the pats on the back in the gas stations. Um, all of your support just means a lot to them. So my, my job here today is um, I'm the agency administrator's rep. The agency administrator for the um, Shasta Trinity National Forest is Carrie Otto, and I'm here as her representative. That being said, uh, um, let me just say um, how much I appreciate all the firefighters that are out on the lines trying to, uh, trying to get a handle on this fire. Um, and... You know, standing here is the perfect place to talk about some of the obstacles to fighting fire on the Shasta Trinity National Forest, as well as on the Six Rivers. Um, it's such beautiful ground, um, and it's steep and has a lot of drainages and, and things that you already know. Um, mostly, I want to come over and just say thank you. I want to thank the Red Cross for taking such good care of our folks that, um, that have had to evacuate. I want to thank the community for your patience. Um, I'm, I was really happy the team took a, took a, a, a patient approach to, to watch the fire kind of back down to the river. Um, and I think that, that has paid dividends for them so far. Um, and I know it's been uh, uh, better for the resources to, to kind of wait and see. And, and so we're really grateful for that. Um, mostly I just want you all to know that, you know, it is an, it is an honor and a privilege to work for you and on your national forest. And I know that many of you have ties to, to this land before it was even a national forest. And I just want to thank you for the honor of, of being able to work for you. Um, there's going to be a lot of speakers up tonight. 
to, to kind of lay out what's going on with the fire and what has been happening. If you have any questions, please please take the time to ask and, and take advantage of all of us that are here to, to answer your questions. But um, again, thank you so much. And if there's anything that, that we can do um, to provide you with more information or to make sure that you know kind of what's going on out there, please please let us know because that's we want to make sure that you are uh, well informed. And again, thank you so much uh, to the volunteer fire departments um, and to the communities. Um, and there was a, one other thing. I wanted to let you know that even with the Monument Fire, that the Six Rivers and the Shasta Trinity also have resources still set aside to um, deal with any new fire starts. Um, so if there was uh, any uh, anything new that popped up, we've got um, four engines on the, the Trinity River Management Unit, and uh, there's some on here on the down the Six Rivers uh, side of the world that can help respond to anything new. So thank you to all you firefighters that are out there on the lines. Thank you so much to the community for the honor um, of getting to work for you and for your support. Thank you, Chair. Brandon? Brandon Peterson, our, one of our operations folks. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, Brandon Peterson, um, I, I'm in charge of Branch 1. Uh, we have this geographically broken out, so I'm going to speak from uh, this location um, down here along the 60 road to our southeast, um, and eventually up here where we're, we're still looking to try to piece this together. <clears throat> so as I speak, I'm going to say us and we a lot. Uh, it's not necessarily us and we, the Alaska team. We're, we're a, a small part of it. I want to give credit where credit's due. Uh, we've been getting a lot of help and assistance from uh, not only the community, um, DOT, we're getting a ton of help from DOT, the California Highway Patrol, uh, the Six Rivers, uh, National Forest Fire Staff, uh, Fred Berger's in the back there. He's been super helpful, uh, just kind of leading and, and guiding us in the right direction, just helping with efficiencies. Uh, the Shasta T Fire Management Staff, uh, Todd Wright down at Hawkins Bar, who's going through a tremendous effort to get his community uh, um, uh, firewise down there. So lots of effort. So when I say we, I mean all of us, the community, everybody. Uh, so current situation, uh, back here at the division break along the 60 road, that's looking pretty good. It's not as bomb proof as we want it to be. It's not mopped in uh, far enough to where we can walk away from it. We just chose, or we had to, we had to shift resources north to get up here a couple days ago so we're maintaining a presence along that 60 road uh, it's looking really good we just don't want to turn our back on that um, our biggest our biggest concern right now uh, the last couple days and it continues to be a concern is right back down here at the new river and the trinity that confluence um, right in this location so that we watched that for days and days, and that was naturally coming together. It was burning how uh, we wanted it to. Um, it did come together uh, a couple days ago, but it started to bubble on us. So we hit it with buckets uh, from the hella base here, hit it with buckets and knocked it down. But what that did is it left about 10 or 15 acres there uh, that it's wet and unburned. And as that fire creeped down through uh, where the buckets dropped, it left a mosaic pattern. Anyway, they're up there hitting it with buckets right now. It's just an area we just got to continue to watch. It's kind of the linchpin um, for us to feel, uh, feel a lot better about moving up and around the corner because you want to watch your back door, right? Um, currently, well, we did get a report about a half hour ago that we did get a small spot across the, um, across the, the new river. It's on the south-facing or south-east-facing uh, slope. It's in sparse fuels. That's where all these helicopters are heading right now They're uh, to see about knocking that down. So um, I'll get a report as soon as I leave here. Likely we'll knock it down. Um, okay. Uh, from there, up the New River, uh, we, we've, we've been putting jumpers in the New River. That You guys know that super steep, tough country in there. You can't just put any firefighter in there you got to put your trusted we call them the billy goats the, the folks that are super sure on their feet and that um, 
are pretty much self-contained in there that don't need any, any uh, much assistance at all. We've been watching that new river. It is looking good up the new river up to Bell Flat. A um, handful of days ago, we caught the slop or a spot crossed over uh, the new river. And again, thanks to Fred and his staff and their quick response and assist, uh, working right alongside and in with us, uh, that, that was caught. And that could have been a game changer to this fire. So again, shout out to Fred and his fire staff. Uh, so currently, uh, currently what we have going on is uh, Trinity Village, the ridge system, the this, this series of roads and ridge systems that lead on up to the Trinity Alps. Uh, that's been left op open in the past. Um, and we, uh, the dozers, will, will finish up that push all the way up to the Trinity uh, Wilderness today. And they're going to turn around and start walking their way back. And that's about a nine-mile section. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, turn around, come back, and then just continue to improve upon that as the, as, uh, um, as the days go by. So if and when that comes into play and we have to burn that, we have the best chance possible there, and we're feeling pretty good about that. So we're concentrating a lot of, a lot of our efforts in uh, uh, at the Big Creek drainage now. That fire rolled up over the ridge, got into a 2015 burn, and it's just kind of sitting there. You know, it's kind of, it's sitting there, it'll tr uh, torch a tree out here or there. It's smoldering, it's ground fire. Um, we're hitting it with buckets. We're trying to, we're, we're trying to stitch together um, a system or a path to eventually get this, uh, to, to get it hooked up in this northeast corner and tied back into a road system where we can start making uh, quicker work of con uh, containment lines. Problem is, it's super steep, and again, you just can't put any old wildland firefighter in there. They have to be, uh, they have to be very sure on their feet. So, very tough piece of ground right here. Uh, they do have a good plan, lots of options, and uh, we're cautiously optimistic that that's going to uh, be successful up in that neck of the woods. Um, that, that, that's really what we have going on uh, in a nutshell. And um, I'll pass it off. Are we doing questions after? At the end? Okay. All right. Brad? Brad Walsh, I'm one of the ops section chiefs. We actually have four ops section chiefs on the fire. Uh, we have one that's the line ops that's responsible for the resources on the ground and for the aviation assets. We also then have a planning ops that she's responsible primarily for looking at today's plan and working on tomorrow's plan. Um, we also have a night ops so that we can have uh, time off in the evening for an hour or two. Um, and then we have myself, I'm what's called a strategic operations section chief. And I'm kind of looking at, you know, futuring, you know, what's going to happen three to seven days out and beyond. So that's kind of my role. Tonight, my role, I'm going to play the part of a weatherman. I do that on TV, but not in real life. We actually do have a weather uh, meteorologist from the National Weather Service. Actually, we have two because this fire is actually zoned. The Alaska Incident Management Team has the north part of the fire, and then CAL Fire 5 is on the south part of the fire. Each, each team has an incident meteorologist, and their day job is that they do weather for the Weather Service. So um, I'll hit the weather highlights, and I'm going to, I don't want to mess up, so I'm going to look at. Uh, uh, forecast but basically what we have weather wise coming through here is we're going to be in a, a warmer and drier pattern for the next few days there's actually a red flag warning not for our fire area but for um, the Redding area and the Sacramento Valley for high winds um, low RHs and high temperatures we're still going to see some of that effect but it's not enough to be a red flag warning uh, we're going to see some winds um, in increase in winds uh, we could see winds up to 25 miles an hour on the ridge lines um, we're going to see our temperatures uh, increase into the 90s, and then our relative humidity. And the relative humidity is a major driver for fire. Um, that's, that's looking like it could hit 10% by Saturday. So the next three days are kind of crucial days from a weather standpoint, and we'll be watching that. The one positive thing that I do see about that, though, is with all the fires going on in the area, and one of the things that's happened during our tenure on the fire, um, we've got the river complex going on to the north of us. Uh, the summer fire and uh, one other fire near there, nearby. If we get enough of a northeasterly flow in here, that's going to put smoke over the fire. And, and that solar radiation really has been hampering the fire from getting up and really wanting to move. 
We have seen though when when we do get clear air, like this side of the fire seems to, we've had kind of a westerly flow the last few days. This side of the fire has been exposed a little bit more to that solar radiation. When we do get that solar radiation, the fuels dry up, warm up faster, and, and are more receptive to uh, to fire. So I think that's um, that probably hits it as far as the highlights. Again, we don't have a red flag warning for over the fire, but uh, um, it is going to get hotter, drier, and then um, kind of a northwesterly flow switching to that northeast and do feel like with that northeasterly flow not only will we have the smoke from our own fire but the uh, fire to the north of us. As far as on the fire behavior front um, with that smoke kind of being in the in in our fire area since we've been here you know kind of moves on and off our fuels have cooled down just a little bit but we have had this the uh, Cal Fire folks have been having you know a a number of good battles down here as far as the fire behavior down here. They've had a little more activity um, than we have. A couple of areas of, uh, that we've been really watching as far as from a fire behavior standpoint, um, and it's a little ways away from here, but in our, our branch 40, this area is in really steep terrain, and uh, it's in the uh, proposed wilderness area, where it's in part proposed wilderness because it was probably too steep to log at one point in time. So there's, there's a reason why it was, is, is being looked at as wilderness. But that, that area hasn't had a lot of fire. And, and another thing to note, this whole area, I mean, you're aware, we were here last year. I've been here many years on fires before. This area, you know, it, it's a fire-adapted community. So fire fire is, is part of the ecosystem here, and, and areas have burned. But those, those areas that have burned have helped us in some places as far as being able to kind of corral the fire from a fire behavior standpoint. So, so this area down here, um, we're not able to do, go direct with the line. So we're doing what's called indirect line. And... Uh, we're actually putting dozer line and establishing lines on existing roads and trails and looking at eventually having to burn that out. Um, looking at the long-term side of the fire, um, one thing we have what's called a season-ending event when we get enough precipitation to put the fire out. And for this area, um, you know, it's like a 25% chance of a season-ending event on the 26th of September. And that goes all the way to November. So if it's a dry year, it could be, you know, this fire could be around for a while. Um, with that consideration, coming up here as uh, as Branch said, and we have we have three branches on our zone. So we have Branch 40, Branch 1, and Branch 10. As Peterson mentioned, uh, one of the concerns is you know the fire back nicely into the uh, confluence of the New River and the Trinity River, but we were watching that just in case fire potentially would have fingered down there and then made a run up there and then potentially spotted over. As he mentioned, we did have a spot. And the spots that we have gotten are very resistant to control. We have right now within Northern California what's called a fuels and fire behavior advisory. And that's because last year there wasn't a lot of snow. We didn't get a lot of precip in the springtime. And that extended to extreme um, drought is uh, really affecting those fuels. So if, if an ember from a, you know, if something torches out and ember falls on a receptive fuel, um, we're, we're saying... Like today, it was like 90% probability that 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 thing that piece of fuel would start on fire. So with that uh, high resistance to control, so if we can't get on that spot right away with helicopters or other resources on the ground, that that has potential to grow very fast. Uh, coming up to the top, you know, the fire has been working its way into the wilderness. Uh, with once it gets well established into the wilderness, we start getting more rocky terrain. The fuels aren't as con the continuity isn't as thick so we, we do have some hope up there we are definitely concerned on this eastern side this is the north fork of the trinity um, trying to keep it in there and we do have um, we have put lines in along the east fork road up to the hobo gulch road so we do have a contingency line there and we are ready if this fire becomes active um, more so than it is now looking at potentially burning that area off to kind of keep it in check and we've got some boxes that we've kind of designed to kind of keep it in check. And the concern there is that that fire could come back on Weaverville. So watching that from a fire behavior standpoint, I'm trying to think, I think that probably hits uh, the highlights from both the weather and, and fire behavior. So, um, you know, we're really looking at the next three days. If we can get through those next three days, we're feeling pretty good about things. Um, next week, it's going to be a little bit cooler, a little more moisture, a couple of systems coming through north of us. Uh, probably not going to provide us any precipitation, but it will cool things down and help out with fire behavior and, and mellow out the fire. And, and like I said, the smoke's been the big thing that's really helped us out 
I know you don't like, I, I heard the analogy, if I'm um, just like you're choking on the smoke, the fuels are choking on the smoke too. So um, smoke can be a good thing. The bad thing about smoke though is uh, if we do get too much smoke, we can't use aerial resources. So we can't put helicopters or air tankers up if uh, there's not the visibility. We have been using uh, drones quite a bit on this fire. We have two assigned to this fire and using those with infrared cameras to go in and check areas that um, either it's too steep to get folks into or you know just the risk of putting folks in there is not great enough. We don't want to be put fi putting firefighters into places uh, where they might get injured. So with that, I'll be around for questions at the end if you have anything. Thanks. Thank you, Brad. And again, the fire guys are throwing out some jargon there. So if there were things that you didn't understand, uh, let us know during the question period or afterwards. We'll be happy to explain those. And Brad did talk a little bit about the smoke. So here's a man who can talk about it in depth, uh, our air resource advisor. Thank you. Um, I'm Josh Hall. I'm uh, the the forest brought me in to help out with air quality and and smoke forecasting, <clears throat> and so I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing and probably what you're seeing. Um, we've set up a few air quality monitors. There's actually one at the Ranger Station just right down the street. Um, we also have one in Weaverville and in Hayfork. And so what we've been seeing in, in these places is we're monitoring something called PM 2.5, which is very fine particulate matter in the smoke. It, it, you breathe it in, it gets in your lungs, it gets in your bloodstream. And so the, the, there's ways we talk about it in terms of, you know, whether it's good or unhealthy. And generally, you know, everybody reacts a little bit differently to it. So the folks we're generally most concerned about are, are young people, older people, pregnant women, or people with pre-existing conditions. So if you have um, respiratory issues or health or heart issues, you tend to be more susceptible to how you deal with smoke. And so, you know, what we've been seeing in Willow Creek is generally is this up canyon winds come in and kick in about noon every day it clears out the smoke that drains down every night and we've seen a pretty steady pattern of that and so you're getting several hours every day from probably nine to one or two o'clock in the afternoon where things get elevated in town and then it clears out overnight so it's nothing like what they're seeing in Weaverville and Hayfork where they're seeing hazardous or unhealthy conditions, but everyone reacts a little differently. So call your neighbors. If you know anyone who's in those categories, check on them. Make sure they're doing okay. Um, and so the other great thing you can do is if you are sensitive to it, clean, creating a clean air space in your house is really helpful. And there's some great resources Every single day I've been pushing out a, a smoke outlook that gives a forecast for what today should be like and what tomorrow is looking like. It's posted on a lot of the information boards. It's also on the NC website. So you can go there and find information. It also has a link to a lot of resources that the California Smoke Blog has on health and how you can do things to protect yourself and create clean air space in your house. Um, I mentioned yesterday, but my favorite thing on there, there's a link, a YouTube video, do-it-yourself HEPA filter where you take a box fan and a, a MERV filter, one of those filters you put on your HVAC system or furnace, and you can tape it to that and run it, and it cleans your air in your house. And so a lot of people have that at home, and so it's so, something really easy to do to make sure you're, you're getting some clean air space. But... You know, look after each other, um, check out the smoke outlook. I expect we've been seeing this very steady pattern here, and, and I expect that to change. We do have some north winds coming, and I can see on the horizon back over there, that's probably fire from the McCash fire. So I'll be looking at that right now. The models aren't showing it coming into town, but it's one of the concerns I have for this, this kind of area. So, um look at the smoke outlooks every day and if, if we think that's going to happen I'll, I'll let you know there so i think that's it and i'll be around for questions too thanks thank you josh and now we have your local representative from six rivers mark DePero. thank you andy 
Good evening, folks. Hey, I just want to say thank you, uh, the folks that are attending and the folks going to be viewing this online later. Uh, appreciate the attendance and the interest in the developments of these fires. You know, uh, each and every day I come into town and I see the signage posted. I see the well wishes to firefighters. I see positive engagement out there in the community day in and day out. You know, it's that support from the community that really fuels firefighters to be the dedicated folks, to be passionate about defending communities and our private property and our forest lands. And, you know, it's this dedication that they demonstrate each and every day that really is the positive feedback that we get from the community about acknowledging that. And it's not just the firefighters, you know, it's the whole team, the cooperative effort, the team that came in to manage this fire, all our cooperators and the partners that we have that are helping repopulate these communities. It's all a big team event. And, you know, the community and the support that we see on a daily basis is critical uh, and lets us know that we're doing the right job for you folks out there. So I just want to say thank you and acknowledge that. Um, you know, when I look out in these lands, these, these forest lands have a lot of a lot of value to different people. You know, we have diverse communities along these river corridors, um, and we all have different sets of values, you know, aesthetic beauty. Maybe the forest provides contract opportunities, businesses. And then there's the indigenous people that have been in here 5,000 plus years, according to the data we see, that, that value these lands for the cultural products and the cultural life that it provides for them. So. You know, besides protecting private property, um, saving lives, and defending our communities, you know, it's also about preserving this land. And um, the forests want to acknowledge that. This means different things to different people. And these forests have special value to all of us, I'm sure everyone included here at this meeting. So, again, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Six Rivers National Forest and the Shasta Trinity National Forest. And... Uh, Thanks again, folks, for your attendance. Thank you, Mark. And uh, next we have one of our incident commanders. Thank you, Chuck. Hello, Chuck Russell, uh, Deputy Incident Commander with Alaska Team. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about what we do. Um, we are an interagency incident management team uh, from Alaska. We have uh, community, uh, local community representatives on our team, state uh, representatives on our team, and federal land management agent uh, members on our team. And uh, what we do is when the Alaska fire season shut, shuts down, uh, we assemble the team so that we can come assist uh, other geographic areas and in this case, uh, you, you guys here in this community. Um, and so in 2019, we had a major fire season in Alaska and, and members of, of this forest and this region uh, came up to assist us. <clears throat> and so um, we do that across the country because as you can see by the size of these fires, uh, nobody can do it by themselves. And as the complexity ramps up and as um, the urgency and threats to our natural resources and to our communities ramps up. Uh, it needs an incident management team to assist the forest uh, in, in managing the incident. And, um, and so that's what we do. Um, we've been here, um, I've lost track of the days. It's not too many, but uh, we've been here 10 days, thank you. And uh, so we'll, we'll be here for generally a 14 day assignment. Um, if it's not logical at, at, at you know a breaking point, uh, it may go a little longer than that. Um, but but that's that's a little bit about the Alaska team. Prior to coming to this incident, uh, we were in Oregon uh, on the Boot Lake uh, fire, and that was a little over 400,000 acres. Uh, we went home and got a few days off, and and then and then came down here to this incident. Uh, you've heard it from um, from Brandon, who is the branch. Uh, and responsible for this area. You heard it from the forest. Uh, you heard it from other individuals and <clears throat> how these fires, it takes it takes all of us to put it out. And, and uh, we recognize that as an incident management team that we're not going to be successful if we don't have the support 
of the Red Cross who's who's here today with us. If 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 Caltrans isn't helping us in in the corridor with traffic, uh, Highway Patrol, uh, all of the other individuals that have have mentioned uh, earlier in in this this meeting. So I, I just want to express my gratitude and 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 thanks for that too. The other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is when we first got here, the fire was making a run uh, to the south and to the east, and it it, it went into Cal Fire's uh, uh, protection area. And this line is not exact. This is where we zoned the fire, but you can see as it comes down here, then it kind of follows the line of their their protection area. And so we've been working uh, hand in hand with Cal Fire, shoulder to shoulder uh, on this incident. And um, just like I mentioned before, we can't do it ourselves. Uh, the forest and Cal, Cal Fire has set up, you know, what, what are our, our values at risk and what are our priorities on the, on the incident. And, and uh, firefighter safety, uh, the safety of, of you, uh, the public, and the infrastructure, the, the houses. Um, so as, as the fire progresses, uh, we're having to respond to those areas that uh, are threatened. And a lot of that has been happening the last couple of days. We've been what we call surging resources. And uh, Cal Fire, fire has had some challenges uh, above Hay Fork uh, with the winds, with the fuels. And um, so their folks have surged to try to, to uh, defend the community of Hay Fork, and then we have backfilled uh, in behind them to assist them in their zone. And likewise, if we're in that need, they're going to send their resources to assist us. Uh, we're sharing the aviation resources that you see overhead. Uh, we're communicating, we're meeting multiple times a day to make sure uh, we understand uh, what that need is and where we can be most effective on the incident. And uh, I just wanted to tell you, um, that it's been it's been working well. We've had great support, and uh, um, we're uh, we're only at 20% containment. Uh, it's a large footprint, um, and uh, we're continuing to work and uh, work hard to try to get into the areas that we need to get to. Um, Cal Fire mentioned this the other day on just the amount of resources. As you know, uh, there's a lot of large fires in the area. And we, uh, we continue to place orders for what we need, but there's not enough to go around. And uh, they mentioned the other day that they were on a fire right before they came to this one that was 7,000 acres. Uh, we're a little over 150,000. They were on a 7,000 acre fire with over 2,000 people on it. And we've got about 1,900 on it for 150,000. So that gives you an idea of uh, uh, what we're facing as far as the lack of resources. So we're putting people where, where we feel they're gonna be the most effective and, uh, and, and, and get the most done and, and protecting uh, the values at risk that we've been uh, tasked with taking care of. And I'll turn it back to you, and uh, I guess we'll be going to questions. Thank you, Chuck, and all of our speakers. So we've talked at you long enough, I think, probably. It's your turn. If you have questions, uh, you can step up to the mic and ask them, or you can just ask them and I'll repeat them. Are there any questions? You got a, a wealth of knowledge here. Yes, ma'am. Is there a reason why there are more resources on other fires? Well, I... That was earlier in the season when more people were available. If, so why did that smaller fire get more stuff? So across the nation, uh, you know, we, we work in the incident command system and across the nation we have resources scattered um, all over. And this geographic area went to a planning level five, which is the highest level as far as preparedness goes. And uh, which, which they're very taxing with the amount of fires. Uh, the Northern Rockies was also in a PL-5, and uh, the Pacific Northwest was also in a PL-5 because of the number of fires. And so those resources were spread uh, throughout all of those geographic areas. And, and that fire that you talk about earlier on 
was before all those other geographic areas started to weigh in with the numbers of fires that they had. And so then it just it just spreads out the, the number of resources between you know the firefighters between all of those different geographic areas. And the other thing that I would mention is you, you see how hot and dry it is here. Uh, just the other day there were several initial attack fires that happened in this geographic area. We've got to keep some firefighters, not all piled into one area so that they can take care of those too so that we don't have another large fire on our hands and so that's that's where we're at as far as resources uh, the northern rockies got a little bit of moisture and so there we're actually getting a, a type one incident interagency hot shot crew from from them uh, so as their season kind of hopefully winds down let's let's hope that that's going to be the case uh, we'll hopefully get some more resources from that area did, did that answer your question you're welcome. All right. Other questions? Over here. Could, could you step closer to the mic, sir? Just so everybody can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You can hear me without it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering, it's 30 acres. What shape will it be in by Saturday? Because we're supposed to be going in there and doing some chipping. The Royal Quick Fire Safe Council. And I'm just trying to get a make on, is it going to be safe enough for us to get in? So the question is about Trinity Acres? Yes, it's a subdivision. Okay. Uh, in the Hawkins Bar. Oh, near Hawkins Bar. Yeah. Okay, is uh, Brandon still here or did he leave? Oh, there he is. So I, I want to understand your question. When is it going to be safe to go back into Trinity Village? Well, we're going in there doing some tripping Saturday. Yeah. And we, I'm trying to say, hey, is it going to be safe for us to get in there with a 10-inch stripper and start chipping the brush they got down? Yes, absolutely. And the reason is, is we're leaving leader. We have leadership there that uh, uh, that we have that's going to stay, and also Todd Todd Wright with the yeah. the volunteer fire department. We're, we're connected. He's listening to our radio uh, traffic. We're we're right there with him. And so, if there's if there's any push from the fire or anything uh, that we see that's dangerous, uh, uh, I imagine through the Facebook page that Todd Wright is operating, you guys will be the first to know. But yeah, the answer is yes. You can get in there and chip. How about help? What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> we take help. <laughs> no, but most people in our chipping crew is. I'm 73, I'm the youngest one. I'm just now starting to hand it off to the younger folks. So if there's yeah, somebody yeah. who wants to help, come out there and we can get initiated. All right. All right, that's, uh, again, Todd Wright. Todd Wright's leading the charge on that. Do you know Todd? Yes, I do. All right. Thanks. All right. Other questions? Let's take the one behind you there. Yes, ma'am. No, that's fine. So the question, and Brad will come up and try and tackle this, is she's looking at a map, and there's a number of them out there that use MODIS, which is a fire detection system based on satellites, which is not always accurate. And I'll let a guy who knows more about it talk about it. Yeah, I'm not going to speak as far as how they're managing the fire on the south end, but with those MODIS dots, I can remember when MODIS first came out, and we'd see a dot on the computer screen, and we'd hike out, you know, a mile looking for this spot. And those modus dots are approximations. I mean, they, they, in fact, I think in the description, it even says that they can be off by one kilometer. So we kind of use modus to look at the general progression of the fire, but not for precision um, of the fire itself. 
and I believe probably your best source would be the NC web map on, on a daily basis. That's updated based on we almost every evening, sometimes, you know, if the aircraft has some mechanical issues or if there's too much cloud cover, we don't get infrared flights. But every night um, the fires are flown with infrared flights, and, and that would be, I mean, for the public's use, the most accurate uh, mapping, and, and that would be on the Insta website. So, Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you can take the next one, too. So that question was, we finish our time here next week. What happens then? Who's, who's coming next, or what happens? Um, so we will transition with another incident, ma another type one incident management team that's been ordered. And uh, if uh, prior to us getting here, um, this is going to get confusing because it's on the south zone is Cal Fire Team Five, and who will be replacing us on the on the north end is California Team Five. Uh, so anyway, uh, they were who was here before us. We transitioned with them. And uh, then they will transition with us. Our last work day uh, will be uh, on the 30th, and uh, and then um, they will take over the the next morning. Does, did that answer your question? So then another question was talking about the the National Guard and the military. Uh, you know whether they can assist or not. And, um, so just like we have an allocation of resources uh, of, of, of engines and, and crews and helicopters uh, based on priority, that's the same thing with the military. And, and one of the things that I, I want to explain to the group is it's not just so easy as to bring in a battalion and plug them into the fire. They're the, they're the greatest fighting force in the world. However, uh, when it comes to fire, uh, just like we would need help if we went and assisted them, uh, they need help when they come and assist us. And so for each battalion, we, we generally have 50 of our overhead uh, that embed with them to assist them on the fire line. And uh, so we, uh, there's 200 uh, that are coming from Joint Base Lewis-McChord, and they're, they're going to be tied into the Dixie Fire on the east side. Um, and so they will be assisting them, but it, it takes, once again, 50 of our folks. And so we've got uh, uh, seven uh, land management veteran crews we're shutting one of those down uh, because obviously they're veterans and they speak the military language and uh, plus they've got the fire experience. So we, we embed them uh, with others uh, to assist. And so <clears throat> there is a lack of mid-level leadership period uh, when it comes to uh, this incident and other incidents. And so it's, it's not just as easy as, as pushing, the, pushing the button for the military. Uh, the National Guard is assisting uh, specifically in the south zone, uh, they've got a bunch of fuel trucks. Uh, we were having a hard time finding fuel trucks to go around and, and keep our, our equipment and stuff running, and so they, they are there assisting in that capacity, um, and, and, and they're spread out. Uh, we utilized them up on the bootleg too, but once again, it, it takes quite a bit of lift on our end uh, to utilize them, and, and when we do get them, they're great help, but it's not just as easy as, as plug and play. Thank you, Chuck. Let's take one more question for the formal stuff, and then we'll turn off all this fancy stuff. And uh, you can, and but we'll be around and answer as many questions as you have. Yes, sir. How's it going? Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to all the firefighters for your uh, your efforts and, and work. We really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, to ask a question of the division chief uh, about division a and the branch 40 uh, backburn scenario like what safety precautions can you just talk a little bit more about that yellow area around high and palm and how that's going to get uh, tied in to the rest of it you spoke hypothetically about a backburn and it just a little bit more flesh would be helpful Thanks. yeah and unfortunately i'm not going to be able to answer that and the reason is is i've been i've been so hyper focused on this section and just kind of loosely paying attention to what's going on down here I I think I'd just be making stuff up um, oh, oh you're talking the stuff up you're talking high pump high pump yeah I, yeah I, 
I'm not exactly sure how they're stitching it together. I know they're optimistic down there, and they've had a lot of good people looking at uh, looking at a lot of options, but I won't be able to answer that. Chuck, you probably you know a little more. So we've got division supervisors that that are crawling all over this country trying to figure out what the best way is to to get containment line in, whether that's direct or indirect. And our preference always, it's safer for the firefighters, uh, is to, to go direct um, because we're, we're right there with it. Um, you guys see this country, right? You look around and, and it's not always possible uh, to go direct. Um, so in different areas, there's areas that we, we're going to try to go direct and then there's areas on the fire that we can't get the mechanized equipment and we don't have the crews. And so what we're doing is looking at then what is our next best option? And and that's what's happening on, on certain areas of the fire is, is what is the next best option? And, when, I'm, and when, when we say that, we want what is the highest probability of success? Um, you know, there's, there's areas that, you know, there's already existing roads, uh, highways but it may go through a tight corridor with with canopy and trees on both sides and it just takes one spot before it's off and running um, so I, I can't tell you exactly what uh, you know in that area specifically um, you know I, I can tell you that if, up here we're as direct as we can be there is a, a stretch of country once we get to here uh, that is over into the next branch that cal fire is trying to come up uh, we know that we can get up to right here, and we know that we can get to here, but there's a big gap in the middle that we can't get across with mechanized equipment. And so uh, in, unless we get the hand crews uh, and uh, unless we get the time and the weather to all line up to, to be able to do that, even if we did get the hand crews, then we got to look at other options. What is that next best option? And so that's that's what we're doing in, in, in some of those stretches of, of country. Did, sorry, did I answer the question? Yeah, we, we've got d different ways that we can do it. And once again, steep country, you know, that we can hand, hand light. And, and it's the best to be able to try to do it in the evening times when it's not, you know, the fire behavior is not so extreme where we can, we can control or try to control the best we can. But, you know, still the problem is that is you got that heat on the ground the very next day and, uh, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. And, yeah, uh, so we, we've got uh, helicopters that, that, that can do balls and then we've got the, uh, uh, we've got the drones that they inject glycol and, and the, the chemical reaction and then they start a little fire when they're on the ground and, um, you know, we, we, once again, we, we try to go direct when we can. It's, it's the safest for us, and it's, uh, it's the most efficient way to, to get around it when we got the resources and the ability to do so. You're welcome. All right, thanks again to uh, all of our speakers and our fire representatives, and thanks so much to you folks. I, I hope those of you who are out of your homes can get back there soon and safely. And um, yes, I, I have no idea what you're going through, but I hope it's over soon. That's our job to get things back to normal. And if anyone should have gotten to the end of this on YouTube, thank you for sticking with us. And we will be here to answer your questions. We'll be doing this again Saturday night uh, on Facebook, a virtual community meeting. Cal Fire representatives will be there. So they can talk more about Hay Fork. Uh, so 6 o'clock Saturday on Facebook. That will also be on Cal Fire's YouTube. You'll be able to find it a lot of different places or just watch it live if you're able to. So thanks again. And uh, we'll be here for your questions.